Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. This week's readings for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 31st, 2022. Uh, our first reading is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, and then verse 12 through 14, and then chapter 3, verses 18 through 23. The alternative first reading is from Hosea, this time chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Our psalm is number 49, verses 1 through 12. The second reading is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. And our gospel reading is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. I love this parable. Why, Matt? It's just a fun parable. It's, um, well, it's a, uh, fun, fun. it's a parable. <laughs> it's a parable that looks relatively easy to understand, which are the most dangerous ones. <laughs> the ones you think like, oh, I get this. This is about somebody who's rich and selfish and greedy and he dies and he's, you know, made a mistake or something. And then you start to realize, okay, wait, then you, it becomes more about yourself and you kind of dwell in it for a little bit. I think what I, there's a, there's a, I mean, back up one more step. There's a painting of this by James Janknet, who's a, a, an Episcopalian who lives in Austin, Texas and paints a ton of parables and other gospel scenes, which you can probably find online. But he has this lovely image of this man alone in a massive house, and next to him in a much smaller house is a family and he's eating and their family's eating, but it's this interesting illustration. There's some other stuff going on in the painting that I'm not exactly sure. There's like a, a small child with like a, an empty space where his heart would be, you know, kind of cut out as a heart. It's cartoonish. It's not gross, but, um, mm -hmm. but it illustrates the way in which this man's inner dialogue is entirely not just ego centered, but just, <laughs> ego filled in every way everything is about i me i me he doesn't imagine a world beyond himself mm -hmm. and that to me is the the tragedy of of the parable that he doesn't realize his wealth could be a blessing to others his his good luck his prosperity could bless others he doesn't even recognize that he exists in community mm -hmm. whatever kind of family system whatever kind of whatever he represents but he represents kind of alienation or isolation in so many ways. And you add that to wealth and to greed and what Jesus says about wealth in other places in Luke, like Luke 16, right? You can't serve both God and mammon, right? Both are going to demand allegiance from you or loyalties from you. Um, yeah, it just, it, it just strikes me as a, as a description of what happens when somebody becomes so, get ready, Caroline, my Lutheran friend, so curved in on themselves, mm -hmm. right? To, you know, expression. Yeah. yeah. But nothing else. And, and that, that, that maybe wealth can be an accelerant toward that kind of an outlook on the world mm -hmm. of me, 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 or I have to protect me. Mm -hmm. Those are just my thoughts. <laughs> well, I think I think that's a that's a really important. I don't know if I would say corrective of how the parable can be interpreted, but it, it can easily go down the lines of 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 greed and wealth. But what you're that pointing out of the complete curvature inside uh, is so. That's really the crux of this, and not only. I, the thing I would add to that is not only is the rich young fool, is he young? Is that what it's called? Yeah. The, it doesn't say if he's young or not, but he, uh, he is called a fool. Yeah. Okay. The rich fool, parable of the rich fool. Um, not only is he completely unaware of anyone outside of himself, uh, but also God. You know, God is nowhere in the plans for his his life. Uh, and so nowhere is there a sense of even an awareness of, of uh, how, what is, God, well, what is God calling him uh, to with this abundance? What is God asking for him? What does any kind of allegiance to God or, or faithfulness in God 
uh, then require of him and and his possessions. And so uh, that I think that's just you just add that onto what you've already said, Matt. And it's a it's a it's a rather a situation of quite depravity, which is ironic, right? Um, you know, the, the kind of the depravity that is that is palpable here uh, in the midst of abundance of possessions uh, is really, really interesting. How dangerous it is when um, we take the uh, position that the sign of being right with God is uh, abundance. Uh, particularly of of uh, material abundance, and how quickly it becomes just sort of a a passive statement where the center of that is ourselves. And um, you know, God has blessed me, where the emphasis is on me, and that's you know, God is just passively mentioned. And um, I think that 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 everything that you guys have said about this particular text is, is worth noting. It's, as you said, Matt, it's uh, easy. It looks so easy. Uh, and, uh, and yet, when you really go into it, it's not unlike the times when ancient Israel was blessed and um, didn't practice justice, uh, didn't care for the neighbor, um, ignored the widow and orphans. Um, and I don't know this painting that you talked about, but it seems to be bringing it to the first century, what the ancient prophets talked about, you know, prior to, to that. And wow, isn't that the same message we need to give today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say this too, before people email me, Janknecht is J-A-N-K-N-E-G-T. You're looking for it online, but. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I think it's it's a parable that condemns a mindset more than it condemns sheer wealth, exactly. dollars and cents, which isn't to like say that wealth doesn't matter, you know, because other parts of Luke will remind us of wealth's demands and it, the way it functions like a God. But in this case, there's something about this man's mindset that shows him to be a bit of a shell. Well, and I, you know, that... Uh, the translation that's on the website, uh, that connection between verse 19 and 20, I think is important. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you fool this very night. It's, and again, it's your soul <laughs> is what is being demanded of you. And so, um, so I think that 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 language of shell, Matt, is important. You know, the, your your very soul is on the line here, <laughs> uh, in in many respects. I mean, I know that soul is different in the ancient world than it is now, but there is something there that what's what is what is inside uh, that is being called for here. The very being in essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ecclesiastes? I think this wisdom literature gives an ancient word to the challenge of the parable in the gospel. I alluded to that just a moment ago that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that here um, uh, I've applied my mind to seek out, to toil, to toil under the sun, seeing that I, um, it, it, it's the work, the hands of us. And do we recognize the hands of God? And it becomes vanity when it's it, when it is our hands, and um, not much has changed. It was true for ancient Israel, and they were called to account for it. It was true for the first century people of God, and they were called to account for it, and it remains true for us. Mm -hmm. And so we must be a called to account for it. Yeah, there's a nice connection here with these Ecclesiastes verses and, and also Psalm 49, one through 12 in mm. light of the gospel text, which isn't to say that the gospel text is just about wisdom, but there's this interesting, I don't know, trio of voices that I hear reading these with Ecclesiastes and it's, you know, vapor, right? Hevel um, mm -hmm. for these vanities, uh, you know, this, this, this ephemeral nothing, right? This smoke. Mm -hmm. 
um, which is a little, you know, can lead towards cynicism in a hurry, but also talk about, you know, what really matters about, about life. And then the Psalm as well, which has, of course, it's, it's wisdom um, language. And, and I love that, you know, Clint McCann says the first lesson from the Psalm is we are mortal. <laughs> like, bam, there you go. Um, but interesting that line, you know, and sorry for jumping ahead to the Psalm. I'm trying to like stage a bit of a conversation here in my own head, but truly no ransom avails for one life. There is no price one can give to God for it. For the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice that one should live on forever and never see the grave. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all the ways in which we try to um, negotiate with mortality, right? And mm -hmm. I, I would rather live now than 2000 years ago in terms of not just length of life, but quality of life. But that's a statement about wealth and about status and about privilege. And I was in class with students several weeks ago and somebody was talking about, you know, we're really not far in terms of gene editing therapies to be able to uh, slow, if not stall aging where people might only die because of serious illness or accident. Uh, you know what I mean? That this is, that science is not too far off from certain measures to extend life and to think about why do we have those conversations without having conversations of quality of life what a well-made life looks like or who gets to thrive on this planet because we all know who's going to benefit as soon as the gene editing therapies come into come into play right um this is a place where the church needs to start get its members thinking mm -hmm. about the value of life the um and by value I use that word intentionally right and just to think about how the parable puts that into view in a tragic way, how the psalm puts it into a view in a very matter-of-fact way, and Ecclesiastes does in a little bit of a almost cynical way, too. Um, yeah. That, mm. No, I think that I think that's right. And I if I I think there'd be a, a lot of homiletical gain in in putting these three texts in conversation uh, in terms of, of where we're going and that. Uh, and, you know, even in the psalm, uh, my mouth shall speak wisdom, the meditation of my heart shall be understanding that that there's a sort of sense of, of, uh, and maybe I would also connect this to your reflection, Matt, on value, you know, what is it that what radiates out of your soul? You know, what is the integration or the correlation between uh, when you meditate on your heart and then how that, how that gets embodied in your life. Um, I personally also just love the word dolt. I think that's just like, when we look at the wise, they die fool and dolt perish together. That's just a great word, isn't it? Like dolt, what a dolt. Gosh, I love that word. <laughs> to bring it, we got to bring it back. I uh, I can name a lot of adults right now. <laughs> I will not on this podcast, but I sure could. So there's that. Uh, Hosea, we had a. No, there, there's the good word. There's, <laughs> there's the good, the good word. word from Hosea, and um, for me, it's the character of God it, in the constant unfaithfulness of the people, even even in the midst of these texts, and in some ways, this, uh, uh, this, this particular text is out of line with the other texts as we've just merged them together. Um, uh, but it, it's a recognition of uh, where the people of God have been vain. I uh, have, um, I, I forgot how much I love Hevel. Thanks for, re for reminding me of that, Matt. Um, that, 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 it's this smoke. It's it. You 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 reach for it, and you're never gonna put put your hand on it, and and that's who God has watched God's people be. That's that's who the Father has seen His children to be. That's who the 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 one who has extended love is constantly seeing the loved respond, and yet out of God's faithfulness, God does not give up. You know, it's that praying grandmother. It's that um, I'm going to believe. I'm going to set a place for you at the table because I'm 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 going to allow you to come back home. And uh, Hosea is that incredible faithfulness of God in the face of our incredible unfaithfulness. It's a good word. 
It, it's one of the most beautiful depictions of God's parental care in scripture, right? It's, you know, we, we tussled last week, right, over about how does the context, you know, affect it or not, but it's, um, <laughs> I guess if you skipped last week and you just wanted to <laughs> this week, we won't tell, but um, um, yeah, but there's that, this, that, that image of a, of a parent trying to lead a child in the way to go, um, but doing that out of a, a deep commitment to the child's well-being mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know we aren't there yet, um, but in this sense, Israel's the prodigal, uh, the, you know, the wayward son, the wayward child that, um, you know, takes the wealth and, you know, just abuses it uh, for self, for self gain and is judged. And yet at the end, the father says, come home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because next week you're going to get Isaiah 1. And if you think it's going to get easier, better. Oh. <laughs> yes. no. This uh, is the Colossians. end of Colossians, right? Yeah, yeah. Col it this is. is the end of Colossians. We go to Hebrews next and have a four-part series in Hebrews. So this is our last, this is our last uh, entry into thinking about this. And we when we started this out, we talked about the ways in which uh, we're, we're exposed to different kinds of a different kind of Christology, right? That and how is it that we how is it that we talk about that in the pulpit? The uh, the the metaphor I would really focus on were you to uh, preach on Colossians is uh, and. Uh, have clothed yourself, clothed yourself with a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. Just what does it mean to be? And the commentary talks about that a little bit, but uh, you know, what what is that? What does that look like? And what does that mean? Um, the book I, I I've always liked the book uh, "Wearing God" by Lauren Winner that really talk, that talks about like that you know that clothing metaphor, which you get in other places in scripture, but. Uh, but maybe to unpack that metaphor as a way of, you know, it, it certainly a contrast kind of to what we've been talking about earlier in terms of that inward, how does the inward self manifest itself outside, but also how does that outward, uh, those outward, that outward clothing, what is it communicating about, um, about you and your uh, relationship with God? So that's what I would do with this passage. The um, text we often like to go to in terms of the inclusivity of, of, uh, of uh, God's community is Galatians. But uh, here uh, in verse 11, um, we get that promise again, uh, that same message in that renewal in, as you say, being clothed in Christ. There is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and in all. That's a good word. Mm -hmm.